So this evening we are joined by, well, joined remotely by James Brydon. James is a writer, artist, and technologist. Their works have been commissioned by galleries and institutions and exhibited worldwide and on the internet. Their writing has appeared in magazines and newspapers, including Wired, The Atlantic, The New Statesman, and The Guardian. I'm sorry, don't mind me. Uh, they are the author of the new, of new Dark Age and Ways of Being, and they wrote and presented new ways of seeing for the BBC. Over the year, James... <laughs> oh, uh, James, is, James is already here. <laughs> quickly finish up and just pass over but uh, over the last year James has engaged and supported artists that we have been supporting in this exploration and their investigations. James is deeply interested in intelligence from what it is to how it shapes our relationships to the world and also how it's connected or disconnected from the world artif from the world. Uh, this evening they will be drawing connections to our theme of other minds and talking about ways of perceiving and understanding the world and how they might shift our awareness and behaviours. So we will have time at the end of this talk for a Q&A, but if you'd like to uh, please join me in welcoming James uh, to the screen again. Uh, hello all, good evening. Uh, very nice to be here. I'm just going to set this up so that not a huge looming face on my own screen, uh, but I'm a slightly smaller looming face. Uh, it's always a bit weird doing these kind of presentations uh, because you're all sitting in a room together and I'm um, uh, I'm just talking to a computer. And uh, that's always a bit odd, but I saw quite a few people just at the bottom of my screen carrying various uh, glasses of beer into the cinema. So I'm just going to assume you're all okay and carry on. Um, thank you very much for having me. Uh, thank you to Watershed uh, for inviting me. Uh, I've been working on and off with Watershed for many years and it's always a joy. Um, and this current programme, and particularly participating in the Sandbox, has been really, really fascinating. Uh, so if you get a chance to check out those Sandbox projects as well, then I, I really recommend it. Uh, thanks, Emma, for that introduction. And yeah, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit this evening about some of the themes of the programme, uh, my projects and my sort of take on them, drawing both from my own artistic practice, uh, but primarily from my writing and the things that I'm kind of interested in. So I'm just going to dive right in. Um, my kind of starting point for this evening uh, is the thinking I've been doing and others have been doing quite recently um, around uh, the history of the Gaia hypothesis. Uh, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Um, if you're not, very briefly, um, the Gaia hypothesis is, is the hypothesis that the Earth is a, um, a self-regulating complex system. Uh, this begins in the work of James Lovelock, uh, an atmospheric scientist in the 1970s, who started to see a relationship between all the various biochemical processes in the atmosphere, the way they relate to life, and the way they related to the changing climate. Um, it really took on a kind of another life, uh, in his um, collaboration with Lynn Margulis, an evolutionary biologist, who really tied some of these ideas of the chemistry and the physics of the Earth to life itself. And that resulted in various kind of ideas of, of what Gaia is. Lovelock always thought of it really as a, as a metaphor um, for simply a system that was entirely connected, um, that regulated the whole Earth system through all the different processes that happened. But when Margulis and, and other people got involved, it started to be tied more to the idea of life, um, to the fact that microorganisms that, that and all the way up to, to, to us um, are also not just regulating the system, but kind of actively participating in it, creating it, that this network of beings that live upon the planet actually actively create the conditions for life itself. And the reason there's various formulations of this hypothesis is because that's a sort of troubling idea to science. Uh, to the traditional scientific method, to the sort of dominant Western science, because it implies a kind of teleology, um, uh, an, an intention, perhaps, um, a, a meaning to, to the life that occurs on this planet, trying together to create this kind of habitable system in which we'll all flourish. Um, what's particularly interesting to me is that in, in recent years, in the last couple of decades, uh, Lovelock has been very vocal about where he sees Gaia heading towards. Um, he's a um, he's pretty skeptical about where we're heading, as understandably, kind of many of us are. We're worried about what the future looks like. 
um, it's quite clear that the Earth systems are, are running out of our and overrunning our planetary boundaries, that this system of self-regulation is, is wildly out of whack, uh, and the system is, is, is tearing itself apart uh, broadly. Um, uh, and, and his response to that has been very interesting. Uh, one of the things he's done is he's, he's sort of reformulated the Gaia hypothesis to be less about life um, in all of its flourishing forms, and more to do with what he considers to be intelligent life, to be do with information, uh, the meaning, the carriers of meaning within that system. And in his most recent work, he started to propose that that actually what Gaia is, is a system for um, continuing to transmit information, uh, continuing to um, uh, have that kind of meaning, that information, as we might understand it, continue to survive into this universe. And as a result, he's actually become, um, as well as being a kind of doomer on the climate, um, he believes that that will be carried forth by intelligent machines. Um, that essentially that the role, the next thing that Gaia is going to produce, having produced volcanoes and rivers and oceans and microorganisms and phytoplankton and, and cows uh, and us um, and various things in between, um, the next thing it's doing through us is creating intelligent machines. The intelligent machines essentially are part of the next forward evolution. Um, well, how, how's, and I, I'm fascinated by that idea um, because I'm fascinated by the fact that we seem to create uh, all around us the things that drive us forward uh, into new ways of, of relating to and thinking of the world. Um, all the way from the, the steam engine up to, up to the internet, we kind of create these these technologies that, that, that change the, not just the world around us kind of physically or you know, chemically, um, but psychologically, they change the way we see and understand the world. And so how is the creation of these intelligent machines changing and shaping the way we think about the world? And how is that gonna go forward if you believe Lovelock or indeed if you believe quite a lot of the other proponents of the kind of AI that we hear about all the time? Um, because looking at the landscape of what we hear about as AI, um, it's, it's, a, it's not entirely uh, uh, exciting, good-looking, happy prospect. Um, I say this as someone who sort of observed the landscape of AI actually over a couple of decades now and studied the history. And um, it, it, has a, it has a slant to it, let's say. Uh, it doesn't take an expert, really, to, to look at what's being proposed as artificial intelligence and thus really as intelligence itself as something that's not entirely friendly to humans. Um, you see this all the way back through the, the development of AI uh, as, a, as a, something that was always seemed to be focused on beating humans, right? The whole framing of artificial intelligence is something that's better than humans at doing things. Um, and that includes all the systems they built for beating us at games. It seems a fundamentally sad uh, application of one's time to spend one's time figuring out how to beat humans at games that they really seem to enjoy. Um, but that idea of competition, that idea of domination, seems to have been built into this idea of intelligence. And that puzzled me for a while until I started to understand that this particular form of intelligence that was being described is not, is not general intelligence. It's what I came to understand as corporate intelligence. It's the kind of intelligence that you imagine if you are, or if you work somewhat blindly for a very large corporation, where your main concerns are profit and loss, uh, where profit, growth, uh, domination is the most intelligent thing one can be. So that is what is optimized for in this system of intelligence. That's why, you know, whether it's these kind of um, game playing AIs, Deep Blue playing chess, or, or the AlphaGo beating um, poor Lisa Doll at, at Go. Um, uh, they, 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 were, they were about winning. And the new fields of generative AI, things like open AI and all these things we're hearing about this year, um, they also have this, this undertone of, of domination, of taking work and other pleasures away from us. Um, I heard AI succinctly described the other day, or generative AI as a, a way for the wealthy to access skills uh, while preventing those with skills to, from accessing wealth. And that seems to kind of sum it up to me. Um, that, that seems pretty clear, that there is an idea here of, of replacing uh, uh, most of us with this. And that indeed, strangely, is what Lovelock, who has, for a long time has been considered some of the, one of the great ecologists, one of the great environmentalists, also seems to be pointing towards that this, that our, that our future is one of being kind of replaced in various ways by these machines. And it's such an, it's such an unhopeful 
vision. Um, uh, and yet, I'm fascinated by how compelling it is um, because we are all compelled about it. AI looms so large in the human imagination. Um, not really, and I don't think we're imagining generative AI, right? We're not imagining making silly pictures or deep fakes or anything like that. So that's not what most of us imagine when we think about AI. We think about the idea of another intelligence and another way of seeing and encountering the world. Uh, something that doesn't have to be alongside us, uh, so it doesn't have to be above us, but might be alongside us, that might, as Emma said in the introduction, be something more cooperative and collaborative, but is something other. And we are so fundamentally fascinated by the other, by something that is like us, but that is different. And in my work, as I say, I continue to try to understand this. And I think trying to understand this is urgent because this dominant model is overly powerful. Uh, it's the kind of artificial intelligence we're getting. It's the one we're going to continue getting when this is a corporate practice. Uh, and that is damaging to the planet and therefore our, our own survival and the survival of everyone we share the planet with um, uh, as an extension of capitalism, as capitalism, uh, uh, an idea of exponential growth that will gradually take in everything uh, it can from the coal under the ground to the thoughts inside our head and make money out of them. Uh, it's a fundamentally destructive program. And we're now building it into the machines that will build the future on our behalf. Um, even AI itself, as I'm sure many of you are aware, is leading to a vast increase in the carbon output of, um, uh, of, of information technology. We're building new data centers, we're building new digital infrastructures. The vast numbers of computers that we need to build AI are outputting ever more dangerous uh, greenhouse gases and other, other pollutants. Uh, so this, this is a form of intelligence that requires the degradation of, it, of the earth to grow, which is not what I recognize as an intelligence. That seems like the dumbest possible thing. Um, so what other ways have we in to imagining other forms of intelligence and other kinds of relationships with the earth? Um, a few years ago, I did a project. Um, one of my first kind of steps to try and build this kind of thing in myself, um, where I tried to build a self-driving car. Um, self-driving cars are sort of incredibly fascinating um, because uh, they're one of these things that used to be the future, like like flying cars or, or jetpacks, and yet have become already present and kind of mundane and boring and even irritating uh, like that. Um, uh, because they were subsumed, we realize now, within a kind of corporate imagining of, of the future. Um, so is it possible to imagine the self-driving car was the question that I asked myself. So I, I tried to build one. I used um, a bunch of open source software and I had a car tricked out with cameras and bits of code and I taught this car to drive. Um, and I won't go too much into that, except to say that the intention of it was very much that me and the car work together. I wanted to teach the car to drive, not somebody else, because I wanted to know what the experience of working alongside this other intelligence would be. And it was really interesting. And I, I succeeded on some very basic levels. Um, uh, succeeded enough for the process to be interesting to me, but I'm not gonna try and actually build a self-driving car that would kill even more people than the regular car companies are going to do. Um, but what I learned was what, what I really wanted to do was, was, as I said, find this point of kind of meeting this mind, of seeing what it was like to actually communicate with it in some way. And as a result, I started to focus in on um, the level at which I could communicate with this thing as a being, not just through code, not through writing it, but as a thing that also inhabited the world. Uh, and so I started looking at its senses. Um, how it actually saw the world. And I could see this within the code. Like I could pull out the images of how it saw the world. I could see what was important to it. I could see through its eyes, in this case, just basic cameras, but you can imagine that self-driving cars also operate within a whole bunch of different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. They're scanning the world around them in LIDAR. They're picking up various radio signals, all of this. They inhabit a sensory world in which they are perceiving the world around themselves and acting on it. That for me is kind of enough of a definition of intelligence as we might come back to. Um, what I actually ended up doing was making a trap for the car. Um, this is the result. It's a, a salt circle around the car, a, a, a solid line and then a dashed line outside that, which is the European road marking for no entry. Um, so if a car that is obeying the rules enters this circle, then it can't leave because it's surrounded by a no entry. It's a, it's a trap for a demon. Um, and it's a very aggressive action and it's 
hopefully quite amusing. Um, but the real point wasn't really to trap the car, though I have some thoughts about why having an off switch for technology is important. It was to find the point at which me, other humans and audience could share a sensory space with this machine. Where was the place that we could both see, right? What was the, the shared space in the environment, in the world that we both perceived and therefore could have a relationship that existed in the world? Um, that kind of fascinated me and, and, and led me to spend a lot of time thinking about this kind of sensory world, uh, this world of relationships um, that is actually how all of us interact. Um, I end up writing a book about intelligence and I, I realized very early on that intelligence as historically conceived isn't very interesting because it's all about trying to rank all the tiny little things that happen inside the head when actually intelligence is something that happens in the world. It's a matter of relationships. Um, and so I want to spend some time kind of bringing that world of, of sensory relationships, of interactions alive as they occur outside the human in what's sometimes called the more than human world. Um, so here's a, a little kind of cascading chain, perhaps, of, of what those kind of other minds uh, see, think, and possibly interact in, in what I find to be incredibly strange and beautiful places. Um, one of the first things to think about is that um, uh, in, when it comes to a sensory world is that, you know, very, it's very far from humans being the only sensing beings. It's very far from, from, uh, from animals being the only sensing beings. Um, all beings sense and perceive the world in some way. Uh, there's a wonderful experiment from a few years ago where researchers, possibly in Bristol, uh, I may have that wrong, um, they used very sensitive microphones to record the sound of caterpillars munching on um, cress leaves, cabbage leaves. Um, and then they took the caterpillars away and, th and then they played the sound of um, the caterpillars munching back to the plant um, or in the room with the plant or close to the plant. And, and they could see using chemical sensors that the plant responded in the same way as if the caterpillars were actually present in that it flooded its leaves with kind of chemical defenses to deter attack, even though there were no actual caterpillars present, which means that plants can hear which up until this point, we, we didn't know. Uh, we were at least scientifically unaware of this possibility that the plants around us uh, could hear. They can hear sound and they can act on it, uh, that they respond to it. And what that means is that, they, that we share a world. We share a sensory world in which we overlap uh, not just you know, by, by like direct action uh, of a direct interaction, but that we're all perceiving some kind of common world. Now, obviously there's things that plants don't perceive that we perceive, and there's things that we perceive that plants don't perceive, but there is a common world that we all perceive. And that occurs not just between us and other species, um, of course the world at large, it occurs be between other species, of course, and including radically different ones. One of the most mind blowing things I've discovered recently is that um, it's not just, um, the, the, the flowers also have this potential. Another um, example of plant hearing. Um, it's, it's recently been discovered that, that, that flowers, which were long considered to be visual organs, essentially, that by their um, visual pattern, by their aesthetics, they would attract pollinators. Um, but they're not mere passive uh, broadcasters of information. Uh, they are... Um, uh, sensory organs in themselves. Flowers hear bees. Uh, they hear their pollinators. When uh, bees or moths, in the case of these flowers, evening primroses, which bloom on the beach at dusk, when they perceive, however they perceive, because we're not entirely clear what the mechanism is, but when they perceive the frequencies of pollinators, they produce more nectar. Um, they respond to the sound of the bees. The flower hears the bee, uh, which is one of the more beautiful things I've come, come across. And, and immediately on that realization for me, the world fills up with some kind of new sense and awareness of a, a greater life unfolding in, in, a, in a wholly different way, not just as discrete, you know, um, 
individual organisms, but of a great kind of conversation, a great concurrency occurring all around us. Uh, this shared world that I'm trying to describe of, of information uh, moving between different beings, creating relationships between them. Um, in short, plants, and I, I use plants as an exemplar because we historically and so often see them as, sim as simply being kind of dumb machines, when, when they're very far from it. Um, there's a lovely series of experiments done by a scientist called Monica Galliano, in which he showed that plants um, uh, change their behavior based on things happening uh, and that they remember, uh, that they store information, that they remember. That's what do plants do remember. She took these plants, which are called mimosa. Uh, mimosa are very helpful friends to have in experiments uh, because they react in human time. When you touch them, their leaves curl up almost instantly. Uh, and what Galliano did was she took these plants and she put them on a little rail so that they dropped uh, onto a hard pad. And that was enough of a shock for them to close their leaves up. Um, so they react to a shock. But what she discovered was that when she did this a few times, the plants stopped closing their leaves up. She did other things to them. She poked them and shook them and various things. They closed their leaves up. But when she dropped them like this, they, they didn't close up anymore. They'd learned that this was not a, a problem. It wasn't a danger to them. So they stopped responding. They, they learned and they changed their behavior. She tested them weeks and months later and, and the behavior stayed the same. So plants learn and they remember and they hear and they do all these other kind of things that in any other being we would call intelligent. So they are intelligent. One of the things I love about Galliano's experiments is that um, it took her a long time to get them published because for various reasons, um, but the main one being that, well, one of them being that it's, no one knew where to put this information, right? Because journals of botany don't deal with intelligence. Journals of botany uh, are decades old, most of them, and they understand plants as being essentially mechanisms, as mechanistic. And so the idea that plants might have intelligence, um, have learned and remembered responses, it didn't fit within the framework of knowledge that we have about plants. So what do you do with this knowledge? That was the first problem. We have to kind of create new bridges between disciplines, new ways of thinking in order to accept this new knowledge. Um, but also one of the other reasons that, that Galliano's work is controversial in some circumstances is that she's very outspoken about having a shamanic practice. Uh, she spends uh, a large part of her time uh, going on um, uh, what are called dieta, uh, shamanic journeys, um, shamanic practices in which she speaks with directly with plants. And she claims, she says that the plants have also helped her design the experiments, uh, that she learned from the plants as collaborators, how that they could show her, um, you know, what they were capable of. And again, lots of people within the Western scientific discourse, within the framework of, of Western science, this is problematic because we have no uh, mechanisms within our knowledge systems for understanding something like this. What I love about this is that it doesn't matter. What Galliano did, what the plants helped her to do, was frame it within the scientific discourse. So that the papers about this capability of the plants, um, they, are, they, 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 are, they are accepted in journals eventually. They are according to the scientific method, they are reproducible. The, the knowledge that plants learn and remember is within science, even if you don't care what Galliano said about having spoken to them directly and having learned from them. Um, for me, this is an example of what I think of as kind of the len lenses we have for seeing the world. All of these lenses are valid. All of them allow us to approach the world and understand it in different ways. They tell us the same thing and sometimes different overlapping things, depending on how you choose to see and understand the world. Um, all of them are possible and we can choose at any particular point to pick up a different lens with which to see and kind of think about the world. Um, these are slime molds, one of the sort of um, charismatic microfauna of kind of contemporary intelligence research or thinking, um, because they're strange, weird little organisms um, that live mostly on, on dead wood on the forest floor in, in an incredible almost infinite variety of species, in fact. They, 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 again, defy categories in fascinating ways. No one's really sure what they are. They don't really belong to any other class of organism. Sometimes they're like fungi, sometimes they're like algae, somewhere in between. Sometimes they're um, big um, 
collectives of individuals, uh, masses of free floating cells within cytoplasm. Sometimes they come together to produce fruiting bodies that seem to sacrifice huge numbers of them. They behave in strange ways that science struggles to classify. Uh, and they are capable, perhaps as a result, perhaps in some other way we don't know about, of, of extraordinary feats of calculation. Scientists studying them have found them that they are capable of effectively solving mathematical problems uh, uh, of, of, of particular interest. Um, one of the things that computers are very bad at is uh, deciding between many, many different types of possibilities. There's a thing called the traveling salesman problem where you have to decide what's the best route to visit seven different cities. Um, uh, and computers and humans really struggle with this because it involves looking at all of these different possibilities. Um, we can figure it out but it takes a very, 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 very long time. And it's what's called an exponential problem. The more cities you add, the harder it gets until it becomes effectively impossible. You just have to kind of guess at some point. Exponential problems are the kind of problems that human minds and computers absolutely hate. Slime mods don't. Slime mods solve this problem, which they do by connecting up various bits of food uh, in linear time. They solve the problem in, in the same amount of time, every time, or a, a, a line, rather than a, an onward upward curve. Uh, they have some other method of solving this problem um, that we, we simply don't, we can't replicate. Um, so th the slime mold, this strange simple organism is, is better at this, this particular problem that humans and machines prize so highly and are so terrible at executing, um, is better than us at them. And we understand a little of the mechanism it can do it, but we can't replicate it. The only way of, apparently of, of, of getting better at it would be to go into some kind of alliance with the slime mold, uh, which some scientists are trying to do, and it, it will be interesting. Um, it also points to the fact that like almost everything we do and think ourselves the best at is done better by someone else, uh, uh, you know, in some other way. I, um, I've recently spent quite a lot of time up in the northern um, mountains of Greece uh, with scientists who are researching a particular class of plants called hyperaccumulators. Um, hyperaccumulators uh, are plants that grow in um, soils that are high in particular kinds of metals, particularly toxic metals. And there's different kinds of these all over the world. These ones up in Northern Greece, they grow on very nickel rich soils. Nickel is not good for most plants. Uh, it stunts their growth. It's very low, um, low nutrition. Uh, you can't grow good crops in high nickel, uh, ground, which covers a lot of northern Greece and Albania and other places in Europe and around the world. Uh, but these particular plants, the ones growing in this picture, uh, they're hyperaccumulators of nickel, which means that they draw it out of the ground and they store it above ground in their leaves and stems. Um, they transform it. And in so doing, they actually um, sort of clean the earth of it. Uh, they, 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 they regenerate uh, the earth itself, removing the nickel from it. And what these scientists here are exploring is, is the possibility of growing uh, metal crops, essentially, that twice a year they harvest these plants, incinerate them, um, and, and take the metal out of them uh, in a way that doesn't do the kind of damage that, that large-scale mining does, but also actively uh, regenerates the earth for other forms of agriculture. Um, this should not be considered to be uh, this is never going to be a large-scale practice like we wouldn't want it to be we'll end up in a kind of palm oil situation where we overproduce the same thing but for me what it does show is um we might consider a kind of situated knowledge that these beings have about the world um because they've got to know the place in which they live and they figured out how to survive in it and they figured out how to do something extract metal from the ground in ways that we only do by damaging the earth in far more violent ways um, to my mind, they're better at it than we are. Uh, and they've done it by, by, by having a sense of place, uh, a knowledge of their place. There's three different plants they're trying up there in Northern Greece. Um, uh, and the, one of them grows kind of all over Europe. Um, one of them, uh, that's the, I forget the name of the first one. Uh, Bormorello emerginata is the second one. It grows kind of all across um, uh, Greece and Albania and it's, and it's better than the, the first one at, at, at getting metal out of the ground. And the third one is, is the one in the picture, Bormorella timphaea, which is named after Mount Timphi, the highest mountain of the region. It only grows within 50 kilometers of this particular mountain. And it turns out that's the best at these particular soils um, because it's adapted to its place. It, it knows its place better 
than than anyone. It has it has this situated, extraordinary knowledge of the place that it's in. Um, uh, something that you know we is also for me completely antithetical to the um, the kind of globally dominating forms of knowledge that are embodied in computation in AI and all these kind of things, where we think there are global planetary solutions or answers to questions, when actually almost always it's about locality and landscape and finding the right uh, a approach for the place or perhaps the time that we find ourselves in. Um, we are capable of, of communicating in all kinds of ways with the other minds around us. It's always kind of hilarious to me when I read another article about how AI is going to like allow us to understand the language of um, another species or allow us to talk to whales or dogs or something. Um, because we simply don't need AI to do that. Um, AI might do some interesting things in that spaces, but to focus on it is to deny all the wonderful ways in which communication is already possible. Um, one of my favorite examples of this is, is uh, African honey guides. Um, honey guides are, are small um, African birds, that, as their name suggests, um, uh, like honey. Uh, they like to eat uh, the um, uh, the uh, the the husks of of, of bees that that, uh, that live in in trees across parts of sub-Saharan and Western Africa, um, but uh, the 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 bees' nests are are very very tough. Um, they they can't break into them very easily, and so over probably millennia, and frankly possibly in in relationships that go back to our pre-human ancestors. Honey guides have trained humans uh, to, uh, to open up the nest for them. Uh, they will fly out um, into uh, near human encampments and they will make particular sounds uh, in order to draw out um, honey hunters who will then go and, and they will then show them where the bees nests are. They'll fly from tree to tree um, until the, the human honey hunter has, has seen the nest uh, who will then smoke it out um, and and use rocks or sticks, the tools that humans have access to, to break it open. They will take some of the honey and they will leave some for the honey guide because this is a, a symbiotic, a mutual relationship. And it's been shown that um, not only do honey guides and honey hunters use specific words to communicate, they have a, a shared language, um, that that word differs from place to place. It's cultural, um, that the different communities of honey hunters and honey guides communicate with different words that have evolved over time according to their specific communities. Um, so we, we speak to animals and animals speak back to us. Um, and um, and that has nothing to do with 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 you know, breaking some kind of strange code. It has to do with the sensory environment, with having relationships with communicating. Um, and I use the example of language, the shared words between honey guides and honey hunters, because it's so beautiful and useful to us. But of course, language is really um, something that we focus overtly on humans, uh, on as humans, uh, because for us, it's such a powerful thing. Non-linguistic communication um, is, 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 you know, uh, it's, much more powerful and much more prevalent in our communications with, with non-humans. Um, we can think too of, of senses um, that at least initially maybe seem so strange to us and yet illuminate the world in an entirely different way. Um, you know, we, we understand uh, that the other creatures have, have different uh, layers of senses. We know that snakes um, taste the world around them in order to map, in order to map it, that, that dogs have an incredibly advanced sense of smell. Those feel like heightened versions or differently layered versions of our own senses. But then we think of something like echolocation, um, which is an entirely different way of sensing the world, sensing the world through sound. Um, it seems at first, or at least when I started to think about it, I, I was thinking of it as this example of, of um, uh, uh, you know, a, a sense possessed by non-humans that must render the world in, a, in another vivid, extraordinary way. And how, what an amazing example that is of, of a, a different non-human sense of the world around us, until I discovered actually that humans are very capable of echolocating. Um, that for uh, for some time, but particularly in the 20th century, um, humans have learned to echolocate as well, primarily people who are profoundly blind. 
um, that there's many, many examples. And in fact, there's ways of teaching blind people to echolocate um, using exactly the same method by clicking. I was recently reading accounts of um, someone who, who lost their sight as, as, a, as an infant who over years learned to click and echolocate so well they could ride a bike in traffic, they could play basketball. Um, uh, look up the story of Ben Underwood is, is one of them who's an amazing person. Uh, sadly, sadly passed now. Um, uh, it moves through the world by clicking. We're, we're capable of, um, and he, he described beautifully how he could tell the difference even between different materials. He could tell not only where the fence posts were in a fence, but he could tell you whether it was a metal or a wooden fence by the quality of the sound itself. We are capable of experiencing the world in ways that most of us don't, are not even aware we're capable of doing so much of the time. And many of those bridge some of the perceived space between us and the other minds that we share the world with. Um, of course, I'm sure some of you uh, have either experienced or at least read about uh, the, the mind-changing possibilities of, um, of, of the direct encounters with the more than human world, shall we say. Uh, the power, for example, of, of certain plants, fungi, to alter human brain chemistry. Um, and I, I'm using very scientific language for that kind of deliberately because the current scientific research that's kind of flowering at the moment after a very long hiatus um, is revealing extraordinary things about the possibility of, of psychedelics uh, to change and alter brain chemistry. Um, uh, that uh, it's that, that by ingesting certain substances, psilocybin or ibogaine, um, human learning uh, spikes. We're capable of taking on new information in new ways. We're capable of developing new skills. We seem to be capable of changing our minds. That there's a kind of relaxation of um, fixed mental pathways that occur. Um, because of course, taking on new information is to change one's mind. Um, we are all stuck in the worlds that we have made for ourselves or the way that we understand the world, even the most, you know, hopefully open-minded of us. We have a way of perceiving the world. Uh, and when that world, that way is challenged, it's challenging to us, our sense of self, because our way of perceiving the world is our sense of self. That's who we are. It's how we understand who and what we are in the world. It's difficult to change one's mind. Uh, but it turns out one can do so by ingesting certain substances. There's many different ways. This is one, but I'm intrigued by it because it comes from other species, from the more than human world um, that allows us to do this. There's other ways of talking about this, of course. I could talk about uh, the spiritual experience of, of taking hallucinogens, of consciousness changing, of encounters with other beings that occur, whether you understand them as, as mushroom gods or as... Um, uh, you know, the machine ales of hyperspace or however you conceptualize this. Like with Galliano's research, these are lenses that we can take on in order to think about a world. But that world has a reality, the world of our perceptions, the world of our consciousness, the world of our senses. And it's a world in which other beings intercede between us in all kinds of amazing ways. Um, the reason I showed the picture of Amanita muscaria in the last picture, that type of mushroom, is because Amanita muscaria is a, is a mushroom that entered into human consciousness through the mediation of another species. Um, um, the Amanita muscaria, the longest known history of Amanita muscaria use for consciousness alteration comes from uh, kind of Northern Europe, from Siberia, um, in Northern Russia, from Northern Scandinavia. Um, where a lot of these mushrooms grow uh, and where reindeer live. Um, reindeer also eat these mushrooms. There's many, many, many documented cases uh, that the reindeer will seek out these particular mushrooms. They, they hunt for them, uh, they eat them, and then they trip. Uh, they trip hard, they dance around, they, they, they vocalize, they have very, very intense experiences. We can't know what it's like to be a reindeer having that experience, except we know that they seek it out. Um, at some point in human history, humans observed them doing this. Uh, they also noticed that, um, that when one of the reindeer was tripping hard, uh, other reindeer would, um, would drink its urine um, and then they would start tripping hard too. And at some point in human history, some human decided to do that too, which is why many of the shamanic traditions of, of, um, of the kind of northern latitudes of, of Europe and Russia, uh, shamans consume the urine of reindeer. And it turns out that that's a very good idea because what it does is it removes a lot of the poisons within the Amanita muscaria uh, and it concentrates and strengthens and purifies uh, the psychoactive substances 
within it. Reindeer taught us how to use mushrooms uh, and how to change our consciousness by doing so. Um, and yes, of course, people have linked back to the Father Christmas myth of flying reindeer, um, but who can say? Um, all of which is to say, there is a vastly greater world of sensory experiences that are offered to us um, than by uh, the very narrow vision of intelligence that is being kind of propagated um, by, um, by uh, the idea of intelligence that we hear about most of the time. Whether that is the intelligence of machines, uh, this new wave of AI, whatever it might be, the strange um, you know, world of machine intelligence, which, as I said at the beginning, seems so narrow and limited and frankly boring, or whether it's the idea of human intelligence that we have, most of us within the kind of dominant Western paradigm within Western societies have grown up with as something that's individualized, as something that's measured by things like IQ tests, something that's used to grade us, um, something that has a right way and a wrong way about it. And um, these are, this is the, the cultural dominant idea of intelligence that seems to drive us and and it for me is is at the root of so much of the damage that we're doing to to other species to the planet with these ideas of domination that's why we treat the earth itself as a resource it's why we treat other species as um as food as cattle as um as a resource for us to use and to exploit without any kind of reciprocal care uh, in that relationship um, it's why I think someone like, you know, Lovelock, having started with this beautiful idea, with much thanks to Limagulis and others, of a, a, a planet working together to continue to create the conditions of life, has, along with so many, become kind of cynical about the ability of that system to, to self-regulate, to self-propagate, um, and instead taken on this kind of dream, this barren lacking in sense and sensibility dream of, of, of a kind of machine intelligence, of an intelligence abstracted from the world, an intelligence that's no longer connected to the world that we inhabit, to all the other beings within it. Um, it's possible to see the world differently. It's possible to see the world as this network of relationships that I hope I've been describing to you, not as individual intelligences, but as a kind of cloud or network of living, sensing beings. All minds aware of one another and are uh, interacting with one another. To do so, for me, is, a, is an act of imagination uh, and an act that we're all entirely capable of taking at any point. Um, and I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, thank you very much. So we have a little bit of time for some, some Q&A. So uh, we've got some mics. So just gonna have a look around the room, see. Oh, cool, straight in, right? Pass this to you. So thank you for great talk. So I'm uh, uh, at Share Life scientist and also a sound artist so i'm uh, so my question is so i think so we can only understand non human intelligence as a metaphor of human intelligence so because so mathematics behind the intelligence is restricted by our own embodiment so maybe plant has his uh, his or her own mathematics or uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what do you think about the, I'm oh, strange. Yeah, what you're describing is the is I think is the other minds problem, which is a, a long standing question within kind of philosophy and it comes up in AI and it comes up in, in study of non humans and all kinds of ways that because we are embodied as we are, um as humans, uh uh we are we are anthropocentric, we are anthropos, we cannot be any other kind of way. And so we have this history of projecting onto others um, uh, our idea of what intelligence is, our idea of what a mind is, uh, and that the minds of others actually can never be truly knowable. We can never know what it is like in, in Thomas Nagel's famous phrase, to be a bat, mm -hmm. um, because it, it, it involves such a realm of different experience. 
and that's that's true and in fact some people take it much further and you can go into deep solipsism and, and, and end up in the kind of simulation theory where you can't even know what the next human is thinking um that we are all actually locked in the little jars of our own brains and that no other mind is knowable uh and you can spiral all the way down that way if you want um uh, i i i simply look for another way out of that discussion because i don't want to know other minds that way right i i don't i don't I, I don't want to because because I see that as a a legacy of the scientific way of knowing the world, which involves dominating it, which involves kind of occupying it in in a, in a destructive form of knowledge that says I only understand this thing if I can kind of cut it up into small pieces and map it out in in such a way. Um, that's a huge simplicity of quite a lot of complicated ideas, but but my my point is that um, uh, I don't need to know that a mind, what it is like, how much, let me phrase that. I don't need to know how much a mind is like my own mind to regard it as a mind. I don't need to know what it is like to be them. What I'm interested in and what I've tried to sketch out a little bit in this talk is to try and find out where our points of connection are because I'm starting from the position, really, in fact, that, that, that all is mind, all are minds, right? And so instead of like saying, how much are you like me? It's trying to be what it is like to be you, knowing that the answer to that will always be partial and imperfect, right? Uh, and that, that's an ethic um, that, that differs from a, a scientific way of knowing. It's a, I consider it to be a kind of form of solidarity with the more than human world. It's to start from the position that the world is full of fascinating, strange minds that I don't need to know exactly how they work um, for us to be able to form some kind of relationship. It's simply not necessary for me to know um for, for us to for us to to have relationships to do work together to live in this world together um so i think the other minds question essentially in summary is a is an interesting question for philosophy that actually doesn't really impinge on the kind of relationships that i'm talking about having mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. any other questions okay right i'm gonna make my way to the back Just come up this way. Oh, well, look, I can see you all. Hello. <laughs> hi, hi. Um, uh, in relation to AI, I mean, I really liked the idea of AI being a corporate AI um, because it does seem to reflect the way that we use technology. We, we think of technology as a tool, but actually technology uses us. We, you know, going back Industrial Revolution before, we have adapted to technology. We've adapted ourselves, we've adapted our society to fit in with the technology um, rather than the other way around a lot of the time. And we can see through social media and our phones and things like that, people have, <laughs> have changed their behaviors uh, in, order to, in order to fit the technology. Um, Ian Leslie wrote a, a very good article called The Struggle to Be Human, uh, where he talked about how to deal with AI and he said, we need to make up, we need to strive to, be difficult to model in order we must we you know the, the, the future for humanity is not to make ourselves more like AI uh, but the other way around to to try and preserve what's interesting and differentiated about us and I suppose to a certain extent that kind of is about what our relationship with AI in the future is going to be yeah I mean I would start really by just troubling the the we in that in the statement that we've always adapted to ourselves to a technology um, mostly technology has been done to us and and that us is those with less socio-economic or political power um, any question of technology at sufficient scale is a political question uh, and we we i'm using multiple we's here but you'll probably follow me um, we and in the industrial history you've described have lived under industrial capitalism and that is what has directed the growth of technology so any questions when I when I talk about corporate AI, AI, corporate intelligence, it's much larger than just AI. That's the latest manifestation, perhaps, of corporate intelligence. We we live within a system of domination um, that has produced all of these different forms of technology. Some of which have been beneficial. Most of us have shaped us. Most of us have been used to make use of us by those who have the power within that particular system in which we live. So I don't think it's possible to just put technology on one side and say technology has shaped us. No, the political and social systems in which we live has shaped us. Technology has been a very useful tool in doing that. 
Um, uh, and I've forgotten the rest of the question. Um, uh, uh, because I just, I think that is the really, really important point. I, I, I do think it will be interesting to see, um, you know, how we, how we come to, 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 um, to become unpredictable within these systems. But I would say that the way to do that is in relation to my first part, also to become ungovernable. Uh, that's, those are the same questions. Uh, at work. If you don't like what the technology is doing to us, then look at the system that is the context of that technology. One of the ways in which I explain corporate AI is I explain it, I think of it as a kind of ecological niche. Um, AI, as currently conceived, is, is, is growing up within the sort of airless niche of, of, of capitalist technology corporations. It's such a horrible, tiny Silicon Valley corporate office block place. Like what kind of organisms evolve within that ecological niche? Um, and so you have to change the whole ecology if you want to see some different form of technology emerge from it. Okay, yeah. Next um, question. Oh, I'll come over. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, just speaking to that, that that sort of like um, there was this question of, um, for example, like the the scientists who did the experiments dropping the leaves and like saying that they communed with the plants in order to be inspired by this, and this ongoing question of how we look to communicate with plants. Um, do you, do you think there's a way that we can form those relationships you're talking about with with sort of non-human entities on their terms? rather than it always being a sort of like our, we're just projecting onto them kind of approach. And I mean this not just in, in terms of like we anthropomorphize plants and animals, but also just um, that translation process will always have to come down, will always get whittled down to something that fits with our sensorial uh, you know, understanding of the world. Um, and you know, when you said this question of like, we, you always hear about AI that will translate uh, birdsong into something we can understand. Um, that is problematic, but what is the alternative? Like, what, what are the approaches that would be less problematic? Or how do you sit comfortably with that trouble kind of thing um, in those sorts of things? I'm, I'm curious, you as an artist, like, what specifically is, like, what you think is, like, the, the best way to, to commune with animals and build those relationships? Um, uh, these are big questions. Uh, thank you for asking them, but please don't take my responses as anything other than the first gentle fumblings towards answers. Um, as I said in the previous answer, we can't know. We can't know. We live, we must live unknowing of such things. Um, and in the absence of a um, uh, like hard um, scientific style truths about the thing that we're trying to understand, then questions of, of faith and belief um, but also things like political solidarity, as I mentioned before, come into play. Um, we simply have to take a position and, and try to do our best. There's no, there's no answer to that. I, and and this, is, this is a hard question that I certainly don't have the answer to because many people think they're doing the best. Um, I think we know what planetary success and failure looks like, and I think we know which way that's going. But again, we're into politics. Um, what I will say is that... Um, if you try, if you actually try and hear the uh, and speak with other beings, they will answer. Uh, and I know this because because I've done it and that I do it. If you if you open yourself up to the more than human world, in whatever form you understand that, it will speak to you. That little voice that you might hear inside you when you're walking in the forest, that's the forest speaking to you however you may understand it. And we're all foolish, you know, hopeless creatures. And we may misunderstand that voice. We may take it the wrong way. We may suppress it. We might do the wrong thing based on it. But I, all I can say to you as, as an artist, as a, as a human, is that the world is crying out to speak to us. It is constantly trying to communicate with us in, in every possible way, every, every single sense and feeling and thought that you have is a result of being in the world. That is the world communicating with you. Um, 
to what extent we're capable of learning from that, of trusting that is that's that's something that happens at an individual level. Um, but to me, it's it's plain as day that that communication occurs all the time. Um, it's not a matter of knowing. Um, actually, in, um, uh, I think he's Sven Lindqvist now, an amazing writer who I love. He wrote this about politics, but I and, and the state of the world in general. But I think it applies pretty well here. It's like we don't. You already know enough. You don't need to know anymore. What is required is is to think and to act as a result of what you know. Um, we can we can go from there. Ooh, hi. This, yeah, this is working. I, I liked your answer. Like a, well, I liked all your answers, but one a couple of questions ago where you were you kind of were hitting at like a, a redemptive technology, a technology that maybe is alternative, one that's not within the ecology of a bland office. And I just was wondering about that. And I would like to hear, it'd be interesting to hear you maybe speak more about that. Because, you know, if you think about like the fundamental building block of a processor, and if you think about that in terms of like materialist slash new materialist kind of means, a processor is a product of a wage relation. It's a product of a political relation with like tiers, you know, China, Taiwan, the location of a fab. Um, how, I was just wondering, like, how could you picture an alternative technology that exists beyond the current political conditions? Is that, it, and I'm, you know, talking about like silicon technology, yeah. is, that, is that even possible? Is it not just corporate intelligence all the way down? It is fundamentally an expression of corporate intelligence, corporate logics, Anthropocene logics, and it's it's impossible to move beyond that? Well, it seems very hard to imagine making a Pentium processor without a corporation involved, right? I mean, that that's just, that's like, it's very hard to get away from that. Um, like certain technological objects of such complexity, it's pretty hard for them to imagine coming about any other way, except of course we do, First of all, we do corporate type things in all kinds of other ways, very large, complex corporate organizations. Corporate is also possibly a bit of a misnomer because like corporations don't have to be capitalistic if we want to get into the weeds of kind of economics about it. Um, there's other ways of doing things collectively that are not focused purely on profit and loss. Uh, and on shareholder value and other things. You know, look at something like the Mondragon Corporation in Spain, this kind of vast co-op organization uh, that runs all kinds of factories in manufacturing and so on so, and, and, and retail um, to the benefit of its employees, right? So other corporate structures are impossible and other corporate structures might produce things in very different ways. Um, when it comes to the extraction that's required to produce our technological apparatus, that's, a, that's another question. So much of our technology is built on damaging the earth in ways that are unrecoverable and unregenerative. Uh, and we need absolutely to rethink those. Um, one of my projects is a project called Server Farm, which is a very hypothetical, broad, long-term expansive project where I'm trying to think about how you do the kind of thinking that we've come to associate purely with machines within kind of ecosystems. What happens, because we know from things like the slime molds and, and all kinds of other fascinating researches into what sometimes gets termed kind of natural computation or non-human computers, um, that almost all the functions of these machines are, are replicable through um, biological systems. Um, so what does a biological computer look like? There are answers to that question that I'm not going to go deep into right now, um, but there are modes and methods for doing so. You bring together various organisms, uh, including humans, and possibly including machines, but also other non-humans. You can start to do a lot of things that we do with computation today, so that's interesting. Of course, how do you do that without recreating the, the systems of dominance that these systems are currently embedded in? As you say, whether that's kind of wage, wage slavery, whether it's corporate power, whether it's just the centralization of power. Um, well, you have to come up with a political system uh, to involve in that, which is why I'm also very, very interested in other forms of governance, particularly forms of more than human governance, which look at placing humans and non-humans uh, on more equal footings when it comes to things like decision making. You need a, a political structure around this that includes the, the rights or other forms of, of, of recognition of beinghood, of agency, of non-humans, if we're going to do this together. Again, we get back into politics. Um, um, so we have to reconfigure society. <laughs> Surprise. Um, uh, but I would say that there's, there's, there's also glimmers of it, I think, in really interesting ways. And my, my, my go-to example of that is 
for me, there's something incredibly interesting about the the energy shift that's happening now. Um, I don't know if it's going to help or it's not, it's going to help. I don't know if it's going to save us, but like what's happening now is with green energy technologies is incredibly interesting. Um, uh, we're shifting from, you know, a, a carbon based energy model to a largely solar sun based energy model, massive bloody fusion reactor up there. We should be using it more. Um, uh, and, and that is changing our energy infrastructure. It's changing the energy infrastructure in, in interesting ways. One thing is it making it more local. Um, uh, because of the vagaries of solar and wind power and all these kind of things, um, uh, the whole e electricity grid has to change. Uh, you have to put batteries in various places. Um, uh, you have to redistribute energy. Right? Uh, you have to redistribute the energy that we're generating because of the technology that we're using to do so. You have to change the, the distribution system, which is also a geographical system, which is also a political system, in order to adapt to this new technology. So we said before, technology is always a thing that's sort of done to us. Well, what is green technology doing? Now, it's, it's doing some, some ecological damage, but far, far, far less than fossil fuel energy. Um, but it's also creating new forms of social possibility. One of the movements I'm involved with in Greece that also exists elsewhere, including in the UK, is, is solar co-ops, right? Where instead of people putting um, solar panels on their own houses, this kind of like quite individualist take um, on, um, on the kind of energy transformation, people are coming together into collectives that build small solar institution, uh, installations kind of near the houses. They form co-ops to do so. They do profit sharing. Um, you, you create a new social form. And for me, there's there's incredible new social forms that are potentially emergent properties of um, these new forms of energy technology. We're going to need energy technologies, like if we don't want anything to collapse. Um, can they be a vehicle for social or political transformation as well? Possibly. You know, uh, it depends how much we want them. It depends how many of us actually do them for ourselves. Uh, okay, we're going to do two last questions. So, then. Uh, hello, James. Uh, thank you for the talk. And also, um, I just want to say thank you again for the advice you've given throughout the More Than AI uh, sandbox. Uh, so my question sort of links uh, sort of to the questions previously. Um, so, yeah, sort of reflecting on how contemporary AI models, uh, such as LLM, such as ChatGPT, are very much hugely um, anthropocentric. Uh, however, it's quite clear that it will impact not only human beings, but all beings on our planet. So what we've sort of been interested in exploring is this idea of whether we can make these AI models more ecological. So I, my question to you is, what does that sort of mean to you to make contemporary AI more ecological? Is that sort of is that perhaps like the other minds problem, sort of the wrong question to ask even? I mean, I think we've covered a few bases of it. Like you have to look at the material, materiality of it. The fact that current AI models are hugely energy hungry, that they produce kind of waste, they use a huge amount of electricity, which is mostly, you know, largely generated through fossil fuels, blah, 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 blah. You can look at what at that you shift. What does it mean to be ecological? It means to be in better relationship, or rather it means to be in, in relationship generally it doesn't necessarily mean better we might hope it means better if it is to mean better then what would uh, a better ecology for ai look like you know that depends what we want to do with it if you, again i think i've got to start sounding like a start record now um if you just want to use ai to uh, make your business more productive to increase your profits, grow business, et cetera, et cetera, or even more directly to like better exploit fossil fuels, which is a big use of kind of Google and Microsoft's AI. They work with oil and gas companies. But that's obviously, that's an ecological relationship, right? But it's an incredibly damaging one. So what does a positive ecological relationship look like? Um, it, uh, it becomes teleological because you have to decide what you want to do in the world what you think would make a difference what like i don't i don't i don't think there's any such thing as like an ecological AI. It, really it's what it's what we all want to do with it who it benefits and how um but an example of thinking that slightly differently um you know one of my favorite examples of of ai used in like a positive and, and particularly ecological way in the sense of being kind of in networks in relationship is the um 
the the program that was run out of the i'm sorry if you've some of you have heard me talk about this before um uh run out of the max planck institutes in germany um where they um they they use um animal behavior as an early warning system for earthquakes so there are a couple of different sites in in Italy, in in Ramma Etna and in L'Aquila in central Italy. Uh, they put loads of sensors all over like cows and goats and sheep and dogs, and they monitored their activity uh, using a using the International Space Station. Right, it's very cool. Um, uh, and they could see when the activity levels of these animals, and they realized that um, that they could uh, uh, they could predict earthquakes uh, based on animal behavior. Uh, that in the hours leading up to earthquakes, uh, even in the days leading up to earthquakes, they saw particular patterns of animal behaviors that that they could read um, and 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 identify as precursors to earthquakes. Um, this is bonkers, um, uh, in partly because like weird animal behavior is a thing long in myth from around earthquakes but it's never been like quantified in this way like humans have never actually been able to use it in this sense and we're also really bad at predicting earthquakes um this is the best method we have in fact it's way better than every other earthquake warning system ever developed um uh, but it also like it required uh machine learning um because the patterns of animal behavior are only legible by uh, machine learning algorithms. Like people alone looking at the data can't see it. You need these complex machine learning algorithms in order to um, in order to read that data. So in this case, we again, whether well, this is akin to learning the language of the animals through it, the animals were able to tell us something through the intercession of these algorithms. And the algorithms are interesting because they are based on the same machine learning techniques which were used to see patterns in the stock market. Uh, if you've heard about kind of uh, high frequency trading and the the algorithmization of, of of stock markets, this is a very big thing. Those are kind of predatory algorithms that were built to extract every last drop of profit while also causing kind of massive market turmoil. The researchers took them and they used them to intercede between us and animals to to, to warn people of danger. Uh, that to me is a, a change in an ecological relationship towards the better that comes from your intent and what you want to do with these things. Um, sorry, motorbikes. Um, uh, I don't know how that applies to things like LLMs, which I just don't want to get into right now. But if, if we're talking about ecological relationships, then they're not things that just happen. They're things that we do, that we choose to do. So if you want to create better ecological relationships, if you want AI to have better ecological relationships, if you want us to have better ones, then the way to do that is to have them. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm interested in how we communicate about AI. That's my last two decades of AI research to bore everyone with. Um, and I find it interesting, the talk you're giving, and also The Light Eaters by Zoe Schlanger about plant intelligence. How do you think we can talk about different forms of intelligence when the little grotty corporate niche actually talks really loud? They've got a massive marketing budget, whereas we sound like crazy people who are sort of, you know, indulging in the mushrooms that we're discussing. It's really hard. I don't have a quick answer for you. How do you talk about anything sensible in a world that's um, to where the loudest and worst voices drown everything else out? This is the problem we have. Um, um, uh, and my my only answer to that is is like I'm trying my best to do it, and this is how I'm doing it, uh, which is by telling these stories, um, because I think people get it. Um, uh, I think you tell you you know you tell these stories enough and around and there's a there's a deep understanding and there's a deep understanding that underlies a lot of things uh, you know talked all this time about the kind of western dominant scientific paradigm that we consciously understand things through again big we big wavy hands um but also that's not most people's experience uh, most people do not experience the world in that most people experience the world as as a strange magical place filled with all kinds of um other ways of knowing and seeing the world and and I think everyone knows that the the AI paradigm that we're being sold is also deeply lacking in kind of every way. Um, what's what's lacking is not really um, a different way of explaining it. Um, it's a different way of doing it. It's a different way of acting. Uh, I, 
I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer, answer, answer for you. So which is my own answer, which is to act differently. Um, maybe this goes back to the, the question earlier about being less predictable or less governable. Um, the way to the way to shift it is 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 not really to talk about it differently. Uh, it's to do it differently. Um, and my and, and to try and tie that to something concrete. Um, you know, for a long time, I've made work that's about about things <laughs> broadly. Um, uh, you know, whether that's you know, I spent like a decade looking mostly at the internet technology longer than that, particularly looking at this, some of its ill effects, making artworks about surveillance, um, about uh, kind of, you know, the way in which large repositories of data shape and control our lives, all of these critical questions of technology, right? And I, I did that for a very, very long time. And it uh, it's kind of useless. Um, I realized at some point that the work I was doing was just like, telling people how bad stuff was. Um, and uh, mostly people will be interested, but on some deep level scared. Um, and without uh, a tool or an example of how to do differently, like it's, it, it passes, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't sink in, it doesn't make any kind of change. And in fact, it actually, it makes it worse. Uh, I believe it actually makes it worse because it, it makes people think that's the way that it is. Um, most works about surveillance, to take a particular example from kind of the art, art, critical arts within technology, like we just tell people or show people terrible mechanisms of surveillance and how prevalent they are. And that doesn't just like scare them and turn them off. It actually makes those systems seem unassailable and unchangeable. Um, I see the same thing happening. I, I think the same thing has happened with environmental communication, with ecological communication over the last God, decades now, where when we talk about all the terrible things that are occurring um, without showing and enacting the alternatives, um, they, uh, they, they simply get reproduced and reinforced. Um, and so in my work now that I fully own up to like not being very good at and not always succeeding at, um, I, I try and actually, the, the work, I use this phrase, the work has to do the work. The work has to be part of the actual change. It's not enough to describe it. You can't just make a work about ecology. You have to do the ecology, right? That's a bit what I was saying in the last question. Uh, like, like the time for representation is just like done. We don't have time left. Um, like that can take many forms. A very simple example uh, that is a very arty example, and it's not world changing, but it's it's, it's what I'm trying to think through. It's like I, one of the works I make at the moment is solar panels. Um, I actually make solar panels. Uh, I don't build them myself, but what I do is I, I engrave patterns on the glass. Um, so I, and, th and then build these into them. So you get these solar panels that have images engraved on them, uh, depending on various themes and contexts. Um, that sort of transform them into art objects, and then they go out into the world, and they actually get plugged in um, uh, and generate electricity, like for the art institution or for wherever they, they end up being hosted. Um, they're doing the work in a very still theoretical way, but they're actually interceding. They're not mere representations of what needs to be done. They're actually doing the work. Um, and I think that's that's the most we can do. Um, but it, if, if we're stuck just at the level of communication, then, then, then I know that doesn't change things. The only way to change things is to make an actual practical difference. And that starts in oneself and one's own work. And that's all I can say about that.